time you see me, it'll be like I'm a new resident. I won't know any of you. So, will you remember that time in Australia when we stayed up late and ate pizza together? No, buddy, I won't. Will you remember when we ordered the pizza? No. Will you remember pizza? Will I remember what pizza is? Yeah. I'll still know what pizza is. Okay, so not a total loss. Steven, we've reached the beginning of the end of another season, and whenever we finish a season of The Good Place or any show that we cover, I do feel a sense of completion, and I feel a sense of potential to move upwards and onwards as we move into the next season, whether it's throughout all six seasons of Community or now three seasons of The Good Place. So I'm thinking about all this, and I'm wondering if maybe you could give me some type of like performance review. And if you've got any notes on things I've done great, I, if there's mm -hmm. any bad things, you can mention it, but I, I can't imagine there mm -hmm. is. Is there anything you'd like to share as we wrap up one season before we start another? How am I doing? How could I improve? I think Zach, a common thread, uh, uh -oh. every time you reach any sort of completion, my mm -hmm. first thought is how can I move onwards and upwards from this? Mm -hmm. I guess my first note would be how dare you? Uh, <laughs> how dare I what or just in general over our game, how, dare how dare you you I think that the addition of Gooby yeah if anything I'm not trying to start any workplace drama I he don't want there to be from me is what you're saying and he kind of is doing it on purpose he's come to me several times saying hey what if we had Zach in the back in the corner and me in the front so everyone can really see my poor neck posture um wow and gooby is a 360 degree being and i only see zach on this plane of existence wow the goob goob getting his moment write us in people do you like the goob or do you like zach better who do you want <laughs> to be taking the notes and driving the narrative train of the show. This was supposed the to be about me. Petrified shark. Yeah, you didn't have shit or to say. Gooby. <laughs> if I wanted to say stuff about you, I'd say all kinds of things like how funny you are, how much intuition you have, oh. and how you notice a lot of things that I don't notice, whether it be the big picture story or the visual side of things, how you notice mm. that more than I do. Now you say something nice about me. God damn it. I did. I did. I did. <laughs> Don't look at your phone. <laughs> it's my thumb. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Into the Time Knife. It's the season three finale. It's very exciting. We are three quarters of the way through this experiment, traveling through the good place. Thinking back, I remember season one of Community starting it and being like, I don't mm -hmm. know if we're going to finish this season of Community, let alone yeah. that entire series and now three fourths of another do you mm -hmm. think we're going to make it to the end of the time knife? The tip? Is it tenuous? Inconclusive. Not if Gooby has anything to do with I it. I mean, Maybe I won't Gooby be part of has it. some really strong ideas. Give me uh, one. Name well, one. Gooby I was like, hey, crazy twice idea. The woman for you, Gooby can. <laughs> Gooby actually wanted to go through and instead of reviewing a, a like show. <laughs> yeah. Next season, wanted to do a, a more literary approach. Uh, mm -hmm. he said, let's do Diary of Anne Frank, both the <laughs> written work and stage productions with me <laughs> as the role of Gestapo and Zach in the role of Anne Frank. Uh, we so get I don't it, know. Gooby. You don't like being in the jar. Nobody <laughs> likes being in the jar. It's the only thing keeping you active. Well, what people don't know is that Gooby's only in the jar for the show. Gooby lives because a full life outside. <laughs> Much like Gooby's, that's why he really uh, it was a soft G at first, but we had to adjust. The network said we we had to make like it a hard G it sound. That I never said that, but Stephen made his opinions very clear. <laughs> you can tell as we move onwards and upwards from the season we're currently on that nothing's really going to change. I think it's getting worse. I think it's getting onwards back. and upwards count worse. for this episode. Now at a whopping three total. Two for Zach, one for me. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach, and I am prone to fits of melodrama. That's great. Is that the episode? That's not in yours. That's two. <laughs> two in a row. <laughs> uh, and it is I, Steven. Both Tahani.
both mm-hmm. Tahani lines. I think in the same scene, just maybe. Yeah, that I, she cut. probably does. Get there. Do that. Maybe your performance just wasn't very Jamila Al Jamil. Yeah, because the whole point of this, whatever this bit is that we do, is to make it my own. Ah, make it I see. Relate to my life. Yeah, no. Can we go ahead and uh, fast track that gooby paperwork? <laughs> get him a mic. Get him a setup. Who are you talking to? That's just yeah. your hand covering your mouth there. <laughs> I can hear you. You're saying that out loud. Uh, yeah. Can we look at what Severin's pay would look like? We've been doing it for about like. Okay, we're going to start out the show by shouting out our $10 and up patrons over at patreon.com slash can't disappoint podcast. Those people are Mary Baker Budisa, Danny M. Lugo, Justin Fortier, Lil S. Haker, and of course, the illustrious, voluptuous Sarah M. I hope all of those people are doing well. I'm so glad they support us every week. And if you'd like to support us, the place to do it is patreon.com slash can't disappoint podcast paid support starts at five dollars a month to get full access to all of our exclusive content all the too spicy for the time knife stuff that you can only get on patreon but you can get a little taste of it for free nowadays so just head over there if you're any type of fan of what we do here to get a little taste what would you do if you found out that sarah m was secretly your mom well, if like the Sarah came from, she was like, oh, I'll make my name super mom. She's like, oh, no, then Zach will know and he won't want me listening to his podcast. So I'm going to see an S you need to understand to Sarah about my mother. <laughs> that make me very sure of this one. I know that she doesn't listen to this podcast in any form unless somebody famous is on it. So mm-hmm. I know for a fact that she would not well, know how to access a place to give us money. And two, more importantly, my mother would never put her credit card information on the <laughs> internet in any type of way. She's never trusted it. When I was a kid, we had to go to Walmart whenever we bought concert tickets because mm-hmm. paying Walmart to pay Ticketmaster made a difference. Well, yeah, you can trust the minimum wage employees at Walmart not to steal your credit card information, but the multi-million dollar conglomerate online certainly will want your credit card information. It's a fun thing to kind of kid about, but it is a little endearing. Like my mom is 64. That's cute. So she never, she honestly maybe was on the right thought process when not trusting Mm -hmm. the internet, just maybe kind of for the wrong reasons. But at the end, maybe I shouldn't have had a cell phone. You know, maybe she was probably right. not. Yeah. And the thing I she can did, feel comfortable saying maybe she was right because I know she'll never listen to this. You immediately get a call from Sarah M. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, how are you? How is your week? It's a few days after Halloween. Did you do any spooky stuff this year? I went to a Barbie Halloween party. OK, Um, I What's had a fit? murder. Are you a Barbie or a Ken? I'm going to I'm going to do my Ken fit from the that I wore to go see the movie. It's like a very shiny, light, reflecty pink, like short nice. sleeve polo. Is it see-through? And then... Can you see through to the chest in the vest? Uh, I'm sure if, if they're in the right light, you probably see huh. my nips. You can see yeah, some nips in scandalous. that vest. Wow. Um, okay. And then I'm going to wear some if it's if if the weather allowed that mm-hmm. day, then I wore some some blue Ken shorts because my job is beach. I, I don't do actually like the beach respect I don't the think. choice in outfit, but I do think it's a little pussy out that you're not going as a Barbie in some form. I think it's... you're overestimating how much thought I put into this before going to it. It's not like my immediate party or yeah. like somebody that I'm necessarily immediately connected to. So it's, if you it's showed up Halloween Barbie... party <laughs> of two people that work with Danny. So yeah. you're trying to be like a semblance of normal. Yeah, I'm technically upper middle management. So no, I'm just upper management. So then who the better than upper middle management? What's well, I'm Michael's showing my nips. What more do you want from me? I'm not going to cover up, dress in, a up in a Barbie skirt? costume. I'm just middle management. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys getting the costumes that come with the box that everybody has? Absolutely not. Good. I appreciate that. I might already have been put in boxes and crates. If the lighting is correct, I'm going to need pics of the nips. If you're yeah, sure. Throw it up on the screen. I don't think I've mentioned what Lil and I's costume is for Halloween yet. Now that it's after the fact, I can say I'm sure we'll have Mm -hmm. pictures. I've told you, but you probably don't remember. I remember. I remember all the potential options, too. Don't fuck with me. (laughs) And I should also say shout out to our very, very dear friends, Drake and Ariel, who are 
tentatively have been involved with the podcast before they hang out on live streams and Drake's come sure. on and live stream stuff a couple of times. They're very dear friends of mine, close friends of the podcast. They've been very supportive of all of this and they just got married. They have been together hopefully. for a very long time. Hopefully, Everything yeah, we're recording well. this pre-wedding. Maybe Zach does have a tendency to ruin weddings in more ways than one. Well, I show up to the every nudity, wedding with the a yelling. thing to say when they do the whole, if anyone has a thing to say, <laughs> just because I like to have a moment. Mm-hmm. I feel like well, I'm it's... a presence that demands to be looked upon at some point. And yeah, every sure, event. the dress was pretty, but did you see Zach Pruitt <laughs> give that <laughs> statement, that little <laughs> anecdote? If there's wow. a stage and lights or anything adjacent to it, I've got to be a part of it. <laughs> I just do. But no, they just got married. I love them very dearly. I want to congratulate Tell my them. father that his son didn't They're run. probably in Vegas right now, actually. They're going to Vegas for their honeymoon. Wow. Or I think surrender. they're seeing Chris Angel. Wait, when are they going to be in Vegas? Am I going to be in Vegas the same time? I don't know. That's for another time, but maybe. We should hang out. They can come see my dancing thing if they want. I mean, they are like, going to be on their honeymoon. Not while I'm dancing. But maybe there's some type of interaction that could happen there if they're there on their honeymoon. I'll have to figure that out for you. I'll come grease whatever up they want greased. So I want to congratulate them. And they're my spooky friends. They're really into horror movies. Their apartment in the coolest way is just full of horror movie memorabilia. Really neat, like walls full of it. They're they're really dedicated to it. So their wedding is just before Halloween and it's a costume party. And that's a long story because I wanted to congratulate my friends on mm-hmm. the air. So it's official that I support my friends. It's real. Are you going to edit podcast. this out if things go really south? No, no, I'm not. Because that's on them. If that happens, I did my part. <laughs> you did live your truth. Lil and I are going as Bart and Millhouse from The Simpsons, and I can't wait to get a couple like pictures of. We're gonna look horrifying. We're doing full <laughs> body. Are you doing yellow? Yellow suits, full body yellow morph suit. Okay, with, thank like, God it's not paint. Though. I thought you were doing like, body over. paint. Well, and it covers our hands, but body paint over the whole face. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. And Lil's making it's like me, an like, indoor a wedding, foam right? Crown. Nice. <laughs> if it's not, we're fucked. Uh, yeah, we're going to be completely you're covered in yellow. We've cleared that it's okay that we do this. I can't wait to take a couple <laughs> pictures of us looking hideous as Bart and Milhouse taking a couple like kissy pics. Lily I really I not... hope that like everyone else's costumes are like a pin or a brooch or like a, a little hat. And then you guys are just fucking yellow head to toe. That'd be my dream. Because you guys would rock I, that. We're going to be the most all out, but I think that's okay. I'm sure. We've That's cleared funny. it. They they want people to do this type of thing. It's mm-hmm. fine. I've got to be important. I've got to show up. Yeah. I got to be on. You got to do the wedding best. So, yeah, we're going to do that. I really want us to take some pictures. We don't really take pictures of us kissing that often, but I think us mm-hmm. doing it as Barton Millhouse would be fucking hilarious. Yeah. I even love to take some like showing a little skin as Barton Millhouse. I think that'd be so funny. So I'm looking Listen forward to, to doing that at the wedding. We're going to be the life of the party. We will win. The wedding is the point that I'm trying to mm-hmm. make. Next week on the round table. If only you'd let me give you those dance lessons, you guys would really win the wedding. Anything else you want to talk about? Or are you ready to get into the season three finale of The Good Place? I can't think of a better time than now to dive in. Great. Well, I hope everyone had a really lovely Halloween. And if you did any cool costumes, send them in to us. I'd love to see them. And you better believe you're going to see Steven's pink Barbie nips and my... (laughs) Maybe racially insensitive yellow face Simpson costume. It's all (laughs) coming up next week, people. But we're going to saw a video today Mm -hmm. and it was from like an old quiz show, like game show type thing where there were kids were the contestants. And the host said like the question is like, what does it mean? We call somebody yellow. And the girl says Chinese. And he Uh, says no. no. And then an Asian boy proceeds to answer cowardly. And he says, yes, that's right. And then they just keep the camera on the Asian kid's face. (laughs) <laughs> okay. uh, uh is right we're here to talk about <laughs> the season finale of the good place this is the 13th episode of season three the final i sent episode. you a simpsons video and you didn't respond to me i am very very notorious for not opening things because the simpsons didn't stop. anime it has nothing thing. to do with you they did the one piece one or the death note one yeah you think i haven't seen it you think i'm not aware you think that you could ever show me something that i haven't already seen (laughs) sorry that was harsh yes it was cool thank you for thinking of me thank you for sending me it i like Mm -hmm. it when my friends consider me and send me things (laughs) i thought about you opening it and responding to it 
I probably just because of how much time we spend together through doing this, I say your name a lot. Mm-hmm. Like just well. because like <laughs> things will come up in conversation. I'll be like, oh, yeah. So this time me and Steven and I'm sure it's really annoying. But yeah, you're uh, pretty much a, as big a part in my life as literally anybody else. Oh, just by sheer volume. Yeah, not sure. by will or heart feelings, just mm-hmm. by sheer volume. Just the amount of time time put in. I think, honestly, we've found a good mix more than we have at other points Mm -hmm. of podcast time together and occasionally having things to say to each Mm -hmm. other outside of the podcast. It's true. We actually have like formed some type of relationship, believe it or not, across the work acquaintances, 12 years or however long we've known each other. Yeah, it's been a while. Okay, season three, episode 13. Nobody's arguing that this is chapter 39 of The Good Place. It's pandemonium. Everything's breaking loose. The place of all demons. Pandemonium. We're getting into it. It's exciting. Wow. This episode you ever read dr- Paradise Lost? No. Have you? Dante's Inferno. Is that what Paradise Lost is? Different. Two. There's two different books. Okay. But they're both uh, about hell. Yeah, they're both about hell. They're both uh, on the list where if you check those out and like To Kill a Mockingbird, then you end up on like a serial killer like watch list. To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't think it's To Kill. I, That's I think on the list. Catcher in the Rye would be a Catcher in the Rye is, is on there. Yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird, I think, might be too. Why? Because it shows that you're not racist? <laughs> yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird is the original. Well, because like, no white one black would check core. out To Kill a Mockingbird. And so they're like, ah, white guy checked out these other books too. Gotta be a serial killer. You know what I'm doing for my birthday in a couple months? Oh, no. Seeing a Broadway production of To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, okay. Oof. I what thought did it you was think checking I was out all those. Say? I don't know. Becoming a serial killer? It's Get always a possibility a for my Caucasian friends. Pandemonium, this episode was directed by the series creator, Michael, or Mike, if you're friends with him, if you're close and personal, Mm -hmm. Michael Schur. Or Peaches, if you're nasty. On the directing side of the show, he previously directed the season one finale, Michael's Gambit, the season two finale, Somewhere Else, and in the future, both parts of the season four finale, Whenever You're Ready. So he shows up to do these big episodes that really change it. And I feel like his stamp of approval on this episode totally shows in every Mm -hmm. aspect. Like the bits go a little harder. I feel like whenever he does an episode, even though he didn't write this one, they really go into the warm, fuzzy, philosophical nature of the show. And you can yeah. really feel that in this one. And I think it does also have to do with the writers because it's written by two that we've seen a lot that are really essential female voices in the Good Place writers room, Megan Amram and Jen Statsky. Megan mm-hmm. previously wrote The Eternal Shriek, which was a favorite episode. Yeah. Mindy St. Clair with Jen Statsky. So they worked together before. Mm-hmm. Megan Amram also wrote Dance Dance Resolution. She co-wrote The Burrito with Joe Mandy. She wrote Jeremy Baramy. And after this, she has one more episode. I think it's the penultimate or anti-penultimate episode exactly. of next season, the episode Patty. And then Jen Statsky, previously she wrote Someone Like Me as a member. She also, like I said, Mindy St. Clair with Megan. She did the first part of Everything is Great last season. She wrote Rhonda, Diana, Jake, and Trent with Dan Schofield. She wrote this season, Everything is Bonzer Part 1 with Mike Schur and Part 2 on her own. And after this, she writes, I'm pretty sure it's Mondays Am I Right. That That's the one that she writes. I think mm-hmm. that's the anti-penultimate. Mm. then patty is the penultimate and then whenever you're ready is the finale unless you include unless it's two episodes part one yeah, yeah. we'll get there when we get there that's a can we'll get of worms there. we'll for cross a few that from now. <laughs> this episode pandemonium if it was up- aired as one boom boom it is one episode but we all agree that it's worth doing its own podcast on yeah But the more times that they do those hour long episodes, the more the line of where one stops and the next Mm -hmm. one finishes blurs in season two. It was pretty clear to tell where the cut was. Season three was tougher. We kind of just had Mm -hmm. to pick a scene and that was where it ended. Yeah. This episode wrapped up the airing of season three of The Good Place on NBC a day after my birthday on January 24th, 2019. Wow. Almost five years ago in a few months. So I was 22. I was turning 22. Happy birthday. Thanks. We're going to talk about the number one movie and the number one album this week on January 24th, 2019 to take us back there. The number one movie this week is a spinoff sequel from Mm. a filmmaker who's known to be quite twisty. Twisted or twisty? Twisty. (laughs) Twisty. (laughs) But I guess it doesn't really matter which form. Uh, Um, This filmmaker is known for their twists. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So it's it's M. Night Shyamalan. 
spinoff sequel is it uh-huh 2019 is it a s- jigsaw what no he is didn't it... no i don't know <laughs> what in night Shyamalan's directed it's lately? a spinoff sequel of his own films oh they were looking at glass yes i kind of led you mm-hmm. to it but the number one movie yeah. this week was glass did you see glass no i Me really either. liked split I've seen Split and, and I really like Unbreakable. It. I've never seen Unbreakable and have always really needed to. And that's mm-hmm. why I didn't watch Glass because I wanted to watch Unbreakable first. I heard I not the three. fantastic things about Glass. Well, with that in mind, if that's mm-hmm. what you think, Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. what do you think the critics score was for M. Night Shyamalan's Glass? 44. It is a little bit lower. 38. You're right on it. It's 37% from the critics. Mm, close, not close. a really good score. But M. Night Shyamalan, as much as everyone knows him, not everybody really respects him. His movies are kind of all over. Not the after place that Avatar bit. The Last Airbender bullshit he pulled. Well, which is clearly his best. And anything yeah. else just pales in comparison. Signs is good. I recently watched his latest to knock at the cabin, and it was actually pretty good and tense. Oh, I would watch that. You should. Was Dave Batista in that one? Yes, and he was great. And also, I like him. Rupert Grint. Oh, shit. Who I saw in person outside of Universal Studios. It's true. uh, Was actually really good in it, too. So the critics, 37%. Do you think the Mm -hmm. audience on Rotten Tomatoes is a little higher or lower? Yeah, I think they're a little higher. Okay. I'm going to go 48. It's a lot higher than that. Wow. But it's not like an. mm -hmm, You're on the right track. Two? It's a little higher than that. It's a 67%, a full 30 Wowza. split. 37 critics, 67 audience on Rotten Tomatoes. But, you know, I don't think the Rotten Tomatoes audience is as complicated a bunch as mm-hmm. perhaps the people on Letterboxd like to think they are. So yeah. with 37 critics, 67 audience from Rotten Tomatoes, on the 100% scale, where do you think Letterboxd sits? Close 46. To it's higher. Wow. 53? It's a little bit higher. It's 58%, which is probably okay, close to right. the right. Yeah. 58%. I would guess. Glass. That was the number one movie. Split's this good. Week on January 24th. The number one album. Mm-hmm. So last Glass, week. we the soundtrack. <laughs> last it's just week, Bruce Willis we talked breaking. about the number two album, which was Hoodie Season by mm-hmm. A Boogie With The Hoodie. A Boogie With The Hoodie. And that was the number two last week because number one was still I Am Greater Than I Was by 21 mm-hmm. Savage. This week, the number one album was Hoodie Season by Wow A Boogie. Uh-huh. With the hoodie. You can just say A Boogie and rap Wikipedia fans Wikipedia says otherwise. Mean. That is the number one <laughs> album this week, so we're not going to talk about that. The number two album this week, because we talked about it last week. Mm-hmm. What did you shake your head no at? No, I was looking up because I was hearing oh. noise oh, okay. from my ceiling. The number two album this week, we're also not going to talk about because down from number one is I Am Greater Than I Was by 21 Savage. So we're going to talk about the number three album. And you mentioned something right before we started recording that's kismet. Wow. Kismet means. Yeah. I used that word the other day and someone didn't know what it meant. I really like that's anti-Semitic thoughts on kismet for me to use it. No, for someone to not know what it means. Okay, you're fine. I'll let Lil know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so the number three album this week relates directly to something that you mm-hmm. brought up on your own right before mm. we started recording this is a soundtrack wow what the fuck was i talking about before we started recording? 2019 january the number three album was a soundtrack to i have no fucking clue spider-man what into about. the spider-verse oh great album i like the first the soundtrack. uh soundtrack better than the sequel that's fair i think Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the second one was good, but it, second I one's think good, the, but less standout singles. I think the score is better in the second one. Yes, but you're right as far as the soundtrack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Did that's less the less uh, radio friendly hits on the second one. There were enough to get it pretty high up the charts mm-hmm. in 2019. Yeah. I didn't find a pitchfork or anything, so we're going with the music publication All Music, which is a okay. professional music review publication Mm -hmm. they gave it a score out of five no decimal points what do you think the soundtrack gets out of five five no four yeah it got a four now rate your music the Mm -hmm. letterbox as we've discussed of music it's out of five and it's to the hundredth so two decimal points what do Mm -hmm. you think they gave it out of five four point six eight it's quite a bit lower really Mm -hmm. racists they they must not like black people black people 
Yeah. What do you think? Uh, 3.5? It's lower at a 2.91. What? I don't quite remember. I think it might be that not that many people have reviewed it because people don't review as many soundtracks as they do albums. You're looking at what's on it to be mad about it. Yes. That what's up, Danger? Post-Malone banger. Sunflower. Sunflower. Banger. Way up. Banger. Familia. Fine. Invincible. Banger. Start a riot. Banger. Hide. Fine. Memories. Fine. Save the day. Banger. Let okay, go. Okay. Banger. Scare okay. the dark. Banger. Elevate. It. Banger. Home. Banger. You're right. It is great. The soundtrack was great. Mm-hmm. I would like to counter that one. I think it's because there weren't a ton of people that came and reviewed this. And two, that on a publication like Rate Your Music, 2.91. So basically a three out of five isn't a low score because those people are rough. Sure. It's not high enough. But that's the problem with, with something low. like an album being out of five. I think that's too low a percentage for that because there's so many songs. And like even if you average out your scores, it's going to be weirdly, I don't know. Well, Not let's segue from the date and time, January 24th, when mm-hmm. Pandemonium aired, and move into our discussion about this momentous, monumental episode of The Good Place, starting with one of our favorite segments every week here on Into the Time Knife, and that, of course, is Did or Did Not Stephen did Steven watch the episode? Watch the episode. Uh, this episode this week. Did Stephen watch the episode? Uh, so this week watch out did he watch the episode this week nothing's worse than when you're at like an open mic night and mm-hmm. the person who stands up isn't very good and the song is <laughs> way longer than it needed to be they yeah. picked like a 10 minute suite when really just a little I'm bit of so <laughs> Welcome to the segment, everyone. Steven is going to have 20 seconds, as always, to tell us everything that happened in this pretty big, super eventful episode of The Good mm-hmm. Place. How are you feeling? You know, it's an episode that I know well. It's one that I like a lot. I think I'm going to do as well as I can. <laughs> now, what that means score-wise is to it's be determined. To right. But I'm going to... to you know, in, in anime, in Japanese land, they me. say, Kampashimasu. I don't think they like it if you call it Japanese Do land, your best. We'll so as the the people of anime town say, Kampashimasu, which means do your best. So I'm going to do my best. You've got 20 seconds on the clock. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Three, two, one, go. Michael's freaking out, so Eleanor takes charge. She's going to be the architect. She's going to be the mayor of the town and lead the people in until Michael's better. She brings in John. Turns out he was a gossip writer. He knows Tahani and made her life miserable. But she's a bigger person now, so she handles it with grace. Meanwhile, they bring in the next person, which is Simone, and Chidi's freaking out. She decides he has to wipe his memory to make the experiment work. God damn, that was 20 seconds? Fuck me in the goddamn ass. God For a damn. second, I was like, Steven's doing really well. Then I was like, no, you took too long. You started to say stuff like, meanwhile, the second person they bring in, I think you could have lost some of that. And just I forgot like, her name at first, so that's why I had sure. to get a filler There sentence. were just a couple of filler phrases when you were mm-hmm. on the right track. Yeah. That's not totally your fault because how much is stuffed into here. Yeah. I think if you just got like a couple more steps further you got chidi wants to wipe his memory but so much of this episode is i honestly if we're if i'm gonna go that far Mm -hmm. you did pretty good what you didn't get is the emotional stuff with Mm -hmm. chidi and eleanor breaking up uh and chidi becoming a new resident because you got the beginning you got john you got john's connection to tahani you got michael's freak out uh maybe you could have given me a little janet but you then got simone and that that freaked out chidi I think you got I'm talking myself into a higher score because I think you yeah. got like 85 percent of the episode. Thank you. I think it just went so fast that just oof, that 20 you seconds could have gotten a little bit more to get like an A plus. But the challenge here mm-hmm. was tough and you almost rose to the occasion. Yeah. And I think I'm going to give you an A minus. Wow. Thank you, Zach. Because if you had just gotten like Chidi and Eleanor share an emotional goodbye and Chidi mm-hmm. wakes up as a new resident. Yeah, that's pretty much all you needed. That was close. So I'm going to give you, you an A minus. Wow. Maybe a low A minus, almost to B plus, but it was such a challenging episode and you got so much of it so right. So A minus to Thank cap you. off the season for Stephen Baker. I'll take that. 
How about some trivia? Let's do it. I've got a I've got a fake hot air balloon to the good place worth of questions Go ahead. for you. How many dots do we see on Michael's pocket square? Oh, my God. I have no idea, so I can't do anything but guess five. Mm. Oh, you're close. There's four. That was There's like two and then thought. one and Damn. then one. He does like a, a three prong pocket square situation. Very I kind of nice. remember it now, but I wasn't counting mm. dots. Uh, I was looking right for the nip. Where does Eleanor say that Michael just transferred from? Dog heaven. Yes. That's a cute line. How long have Drake and RBG been hooking up? <laughs> For years. Yeah, years. Is that all there was to it? Okay. Yeah. Let's, Mr. Visual Details, what colors are Jason's new monk robes? Ooh, they're like a yellow, red, orange situation. I'll give that to you. I read it as orange and yellow, but Mm -hmm. red is in the mix. Sure. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I was really going to go with like more of a red, orange, orange, red. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What napkin options does Mm -hmm. Tahani have? Well, there's the... Ooh, well, I know it's because that's my next question. I'm not looking. I know it's mm-hmm. the Yorkshire butterfly. And the uh-huh. other one is the something. T- uh, the Queen's tuck. The Queen's tuck. That's a good line. Yeah, that's funny. And the best part of it is, oh, and I get it. None of that matters. Okay, <laughs> We love Tahani growth. Truly. So that takes one of my questions. My next one mm-hmm. for you. What assistant scenario has Michael mastered? It's in the later half of the episode. He's calmed down a little. He's ready to be an assistant to Eleanor. He mastered a phrase. I don't remember. Maybe it's not in your episode. Maybe you'll remember when I say Mm -hmm. he's like, check this out. I'm sorry. I sent the email, but I forgot to include the attachment. Like as if he's going to be a good. No. And Eleanor's like, you did great. I don't think that's going to happen in the afterlife. But if it does, you got it. That's not in my episode. That's funny. Okay, that's extra funny. Uh, Google now Gmail at least has a feature where if you say I'm attaching and you don't attach something, it stops you before you send the email. That's cool. Because I have done that so many times in an industry where I'm constantly sending when you send me files or music or stuff. It just doesn't attach. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I like that, actually. Huh? Um, What is the best way to be horny? Scared. (laughs) Scared is the best way to be horny. You're speaking from experience because I always give you the fear a strong ooga booga booga right before we really <laughs> ah! go to go to pound town. Ooga nice. booga booga. Ooga Happy booga booga. Do you put on the Courage of Cowardly Dog Eustace mask while you do it? Stupid dog. <laughs> Strangle what is the gossip toilet blog most famous for? Uh, the Olsen twins turning 18 countdown clock. <laughs> yep. Yuck. Yikes. I feel like Drake had that for Millie Bobby Brown. To what does John compare dying in Canada? It's like something's nip slip. I'll give that to you. I'm dying in word. Canada is the nip slip of dying. The nip slip of dying. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is Simone's Froyo flavor? Oh, that was one of mine. It was half strawberry uh-huh. twisted with when... You look a man down, gets called out. I saw My you phone glanced. is upside down, Zach. I'll show you on the camera when I and, and I we've discussed this. When your eyes part. go off, it is recall. That means that you're telling the truth. <laughs> well, you can tell somebody's okay. telling the truth as if they're like, but you're setting up a precedent. So then I don't doubt it when you do cheat. I've said I'm great at cheating. Um, Whenever we get to a point in our podcasting enterprise where we're in the same room as each other for this stuff, mm-hmm. we're going to be insufferable because I'm going to yeah. like watch you so closely and like mm-hmm. take your phone away and shit imagine like that. that angle when you're filming what way are you gonna look then when a man gets called out for options, taking credit for, sure. for your idea at work yes i kind of yeah. thought this was a funny joke and they could have done better yeah I, oh sorry a male co-worker gets called out for stealing your stealing ideas. Your idea. you gave me enough it's mm-hmm. fine yeah i, I think nuts. it's funny funny joke yeah i have one more do you have more I think it's your I have a decent amount more. What two behind the scenes masterminds does Michael compare himself Mm to? Cyrano de Bergerac, Tom Mm -hmm. de Bergeron. Yes. (laughs) And Chris Jenner. Chris Jenner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll give you my last one. I know that it's a literary figure, Uh, but I don't really. I didn't Google it, so I I don't I don't know off the top of my head who that is. I'm going to give you my last one so you don't take it. What Mm -hmm. animal is in the flashback? in Eleanor's house during the presentation. Looks kind of like a llama. It's a camel, I believe. 
But I could be wrong. Maybe it is a llama and you're right. I wrote down a camel. I'm not going to dock you points. Don't give me that look. You know I can't sleep at night when you give me that look. <laughs> I get a text four hours later. Hey, no no hard feelings I about the camel sleep, stuff, buddy. man. Can I... you like send me a picture of you making a nicer look? <laughs> and you do, and I go right to sleep. Mm -hmm. I give you a nice look. Uh, I'm going to rapid fire. Yes. Where would Eleanor run into her exes? At the dentist, and when mm -hmm. she, I know I'm blanking on the first one, so I'm going to come back mm -hmm. to it. At the dentist, and whenever she texts them to come over, is the first one the mall? It is the mall. The mall, okay. the dentist, or when she would drunk text right. them to come over. <laughs> That'll uh, do it. What date did Doug Forsett make his guess? What? Visible on the placard in oh. the office several times throughout the episode. Is it a specific date? Mm hmm. Day, month, year. If you get is, any of them, I'll give it to is you. Is it 1973? Oh, uh, you're close. Uh, then fuck. What is it? October 14th, yeah. 1972. Okay, cool. Uh, what has the bad place pulled off? A real cork blork? The most intricate. About? Wow, I can't talk. The most intricate cork Class blork of all time. Steven right there. Mm -hmm. Cork blork. Cork blork. Is that all your questions? Uh, I have one more. Okay. What is Cheedy going to think Eleanor is? Oh, I wrote this down in my notes. It's kind mm -hmm. of a long line. You're going to think I'm just some hot godlike figure that you want to bone the second you meet. Pretty With close. the paraphrasing clause, that was really, really, really close. And we know um, the so clause. I'll, I'll give I could that take to out you. the scroll. I won't take out the yeah, scroll. Yeah, I think right I'll give that there. to you. Some sexy godlike figure that he wants to hump immediately after hump. meeting her. Yeah, not bone. Chidi's a man of class. He does not bone. He humps. He does hump. <laughs> he does hump. <laughs> He does hump. Okay, Good well, know that that's he's an trivia. active lover. Good job, Steven. Good job, buddy. You've been killing it with the questions lately. So to save myself the time of writing out Q colon mm -hmm. enter a colon enter mm -hmm. enter Q so many that's times, I just have saved in the clipboard of my phone. I think it has like between 10 and 12. And if I think of more, I just add more to it. But that's why I have that number of questions every time was because it's, it's predetermined. I lay out my Q's and A's beforehand so that I don't have to stop paying attention to the episode to just fill it. In. I just hit a quick pause, fill in the answer, then write the question as the scene continues. OK, I don't quite get it, but your system's your system and it seems to work. It does. It serves me well. Let's talk about the season finale. Let's talk about pandemonium. We're at the end of season three. We've now seen it as a whole. I am more than you, but together, this has been the season where we're not scratching our heads, but we're a little bit more, okay, some mm -hmm. of the season one and two shine hasn't worn off, but is wearing thin. A little. Mm -hmm. Enough for us to notice it and for this to be a more complex, complicated season to feel yeah. ways about. And I think this last episode doesn't exactly take away how I felt when watching certain episodes, but I do think it makes a lot of it come together in a really satisfying way that does show some of the stuff that was annoying, as always, was always meant to lead to a certain thing, right? Specifically last week, you talked about how you didn't like the cheaty Eleanor stuff. And I was like, I love it because I know where it's going. And I think that that, yep. that is just the most recent example of, of the show doing this. But they're so good at showing us something and we're like why are you showing us this and then down the line they're like oh that's why you were showing yes. us that so we would feel this way and i think it's really smart you it got just shows me they know what they're doing re-remember the simone twist when we were talking last mm -hmm. week and it was absolutely one of those things where five episodes ago when simone wasn't a part of the story anymore mm -hmm. i remember feeling wow we love simone so much yeah and now that character's just gone and you were like is she and i was like yeah she's just gone forever it really <laughs> sucks You're like but i mean and i'm like no no she's <laughs> long gone however i don't know if i i mean i still don't remember my experience through season three has been never remembering what comes next and then mm -hmm. as soon as it happens remember but mm -hmm. it's given me a fun kind of second watch experience yeah. for this to be able to track it closer to how I track something for the first time, even though, mm -hmm. of course, I've, I have seen it before and I do remember. It's just mm -hmm. been long enough that I've forgotten. I know it and I am well educated in the subject. I just don't know. And I still feel like maybe in season four, they don't do a a enough with the Simone character because mm -hmm. she is such a great character. She Simone's deserves great. to be as important as the core and their ancillaries. And I still don't know if we get that even as she comes back into the fold. It was really fun to see her this episode, though, because she's so witty and smart and quick. 
Yeah. And she I only think gets that... to say two or three things. And it's so mm -hmm. her. I really like at any point in the show, Simone and Eleanor's interactions, because it's almost like Simone finds the way Eleanor's brain works very interesting. And it's mm -hmm. very like, oh, she's like this cute little thing. And it's not necessarily even like a superiority thing, but it's mm -hmm. just I, I love their interactions because Simone is so smart. And Eleanor is not stupid, but <laughs> she's not Simone. Yeah. And she thinks she is. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's very funny. Before we start going through the episode, there were a couple of things that we started talking about before we started recording. And we were like, we're going to wait. And a big part of that was comparing this season finale to the second season finale mm -hmm. and how they're both structured a little more jazzy than your typical sitcom season finale, where it kind of ends when it runs out of time. It doesn't so much end when mm. the story to this point ends. It like keeps going a little bit past when something like this usually would end maybe, or doesn't go quite as long as where something like this usually would end. And it's creative, but it's also a little bit frustrating. I know you were really frustrated to the extent that we get frustrated with the show that we yeah. both love pretty much every episode of with how the season two ended and how season three began. I don't think I feel as much that with this one. But when I ended the episode for the first time last night, my reaction wasn't like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? It was a little bit like, oh, my God, that's where they're ending this. I need more. And a little bit less in a way that fuels me up in a more of a way that's like, damn, I wish that uh, there's a little bit more to this episode there at the end. I get that. I think that this episode does a much, much, much better job than last season's. I probably at, at agree. doing that. I think that the scene that it ends on, which we'll talk about it more later, but I, I think that, you know, with everything being resolved, it is what it is. We know what what direction this part of the story is going in. And I think just getting to finish on that scene of Eleanor having to use her best skill, which is lying and going to do that to the person that she cares the most about is kind of a beautiful way for the episode to end and the season to end. That's fair. All right. Well, I think we can dive into the episode. What do you Let's say? Let's do it. I got my speedo on. I've sat my flip ready flops to politely next to the ladder. The episode, right? Yeah. Right. So get that speedo all the way down on the ground real quick. Slide <laughs> on out of that little thing. I know mm -hmm. it's got to be tight. Do I have to turn around and pull it down, not facing you like in those movies you yep. showed me, Zach? Oh, point it right towards the Patreon cam. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we the just special get the face. Patreon feed down there. Yeah. If you come to the Patreon feed, you get the entire podcast, but recorded from our butts. Yeah, it's it's from behind and at like chair seat height. The episode starts as so many great episodes of The Good Place do, right exactly as the last one ended. Michael's freaking out in his office. Did you look uh, previously on? Again, a second of one. Mm -hmm. And then it goes right into the continued yeah. scene. So Michael's freaking out. And I know that it, why it frustrated you a little bit at the end of the last episode, because Michael has come so far. He's such yeah. a strong, smart, capable person. But what really works is what's explained here, I think, helps his whole thing of, well, oh, my God, I'm used to being middle management. I'm used to mm -hmm. running something, but not with all of this stress. I'm used to there being like other people who will take care of it and step in if this doesn't quite work the way I want it to. But this is all on him. And he really cares in a way that he's never cared before. And this weight of failure is really heavy on him. It's It's mm. got potential to be an epic fail. And that's tough. Nobody wants to be a part of an epic fail. Yeah. One time I got on VR chat and I was told nice. that I was an epic fail and you never really Ooh. you never really recover from that. Do you Tough. think epic fail works more, less or same as flossing Ted Danson last week? Much more. Really? <laughs> Slightly more. I like these lines. He's starting to get less communicative. Is my tie getting tighter or is my neck getting fatter somehow? Oh, this is what we do. We tell the judge we have to cancel the experiment because I have a fat neck. Mm. She'll understand. <laughs> and John's knocking on the door. I really like the stress of that. Imagine, mm -hmm. put yourself in John's shoes. Do you, you wake, wake up. up? You don't really know you're dead, but you know that where the fuck am I? And this is like not real. And there's mm -hmm. this, this message on the wall and he's getting nosy. He's knocking. There's clearly people in there doing stuff. So <laughs> Eleanor tries to quickly pep talk Michael, tell him how strong he is, how capable he is, how good he is, and, and tries to talk him down. The main thing is, you know, just say, go out there, say, hi, John, I'm Michael. I'm the architect. Come on in. Got it. That's all you have to do. But Michael, there's a, Beat. He doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. We kind of can figure what happens here because we cut to the outside view of the office. Eleanor opens the office door and says, 
Hi, I'm Eleanor. I'm the architect. Come on in. I like that scene. I think it's not the hardest joke in the world, but it still works. I think it works really well for Eleanor's character and where she is mm-hmm. at this point. And I actually feel really strongly about this. I think it gives that character more purpose than she's had this entire time that she's been in her love story arc. Not that yeah. there's anything wrong with that, but this brings me back to, oh yes, this is the main character of this show. She has mm-hmm. learned so much. And as she mentions a few times, she might be pretty capable of being yeah. the face behind this. She might be the perfect person to do it. I think it's a really smart unexpected but still perfectly set up to happen yeah. thing for the character i think it works really well and eleanor at first you know she kind of stumbles into her leadership position as anyone does because she has mm-hmm. john in her office and she's doing her best like michael impression and but it's very eleanor she says okay john you're dead but it's okay <laughs> that you're dead i think it's really great yeah it's so eleanor <laughs> she tells john we learn his last name here is wheaton it's john mm-hmm. wheaton Thank you. In relation John, to Will Wheaton? <laughs> probably. Maybe. Nice. I don't know. He's in the good place, so he can breathe a sigh of relief. And she does her best, Michael, saying, well, and I can tell by your folder that you've done so many impressive things, and I can't wait to dive into them and talk to you. Looks down at alien language. like, oh, so impressive. <laughs> yes, exactly what I thought. Do you like Despondent Michael in this episode? How do you think it ranks with some of the other Michael freakouts we've gotten? I think it's it's lower for me than Midlife Crisis, Michael, but it's still funny. Sure. I think it's really funny. His very quietly taking up stressful space, mm-hmm. kind of making like uh, 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 like little noises in the background. Very like Tina Belcher. I, I think that Ted Danson or Bob Belcher finds a way to make like this episode. He could just be standing around, and I think he finds a way mm-hmm. to make it quite a bit more fun and funny yeah. than that. I found myself watching him in the background of scenes a lot. I think especially after Eleanor has the the dog heaven line, I think that's when he really like if you think about it that way and that people are perceiving him like that, it's very, very funny. It makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that he's like all only around these dogs running around all day. And now he's still getting used to people is <laughs> such a funny line. So John's in the office and she says, Sorry, did I introduce Michael? (laughs) He's my uh, assistant. Hi. He just transferred over here from dog heaven. So, you know, he's still getting used to people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he he just transferred from dog heaven. It makes so much sense. So from there, Eleanor takes John for a tour. This was almost a trivia question. They start with this beer stand, but it's foot lager foot and lager. it's boots filled with beer. That mm-hmm. classic, the good place, like take something good. You can have as much beer as you want, yeah, but, but it's, it's a foot, foot lager and that's all they have. <laughs> I really like the way Eleanor deflects all of John's questions because she doesn't have the answer to them. So Mm -hmm. instead, she's just like, hey, look over here instead of making up something because John says, so are you like an angel or something? She's like, oh, my God. Ha ha. Aren't you so sweet? Well, enough about me. (laughs) (laughs) And she tells John like literally as much as she knows and nothing more, including that this whole space is theirs to enjoy forever. He and his 321 neighbors. And then when John is thinking and soaking in all this information and says, oh, 321, is that number significant? Great question. The answer, also great. Okay, over here, how about we (laughs) summon Janet and we introduce you to Janet? I think a very real thing that this episode nails is when you first become management. Oh, yeah. You're expected to know everything that a manager that's been there 10 years would know, but you've been there like 10 minutes and probably (sighs) didn't get training. So people ask you questions how to do things and you're like, ah, that's excellent. I'd love to help you with that. <laughs> as soon as I figure out what, what that is, what you how just to said do it. Means. Yes. <laughs> That's such a good point. Becoming management, you always think that there's going to be some resource that just tells you this is everything you need to do while you're on the job. And most places do not. And yeah. there is a big part of just you are management type if you are the type of person who can just walk in and pretend mm-hmm. like, you know, and figure it out kind of without asking yeah. people. And that's totally what Eleanor does here. Like she'd be the great <laughs> as a store manager just mm-hmm. by her, her vibe here. <laughs> Eleanor summons Janet. A lot of Janet moments that I really like in this episode. But this is a subtle, cute moment when Janet pops up and Eleanor's like, hi, Janet, I'm the architect. You know this, right? And this Janet can kind of keep under wraps how confused Mm -hmm. she is. But she is like, yes, yes, I know this information too. (laughs) 
This takes me back to season one because John gets his moment where he can get the answer to the first question Mm -hmm. that comes to his mind, much like Eleanor asking if certain people were gay and they're not gay. They're just not interested in you. John says, what's the craziest secret celebrity hookup? And it's easy. Drake Mm -hmm. and Ruth Bader Ginsburg for years. What do you think about the specificity? I buy that. I think that Drake old for Drake's type. I mean, I think he goes opposite ends. I know Drake, he has, and I quote, I even fucked the girl that used to babysit, but that was years later on some crazy shit, which means that Drake also has a thing for older women as well as the Millie Bobby Browns of the world. It's then funny when John learns all this stuff about Janet. It's like, wow, you're amazing. You really know the answer to everything. It kind of seems like she should be running the neighborhood. Yes, John, in retrospect, that does (laughs) sound like a much better idea. And I would have loved that version as much, too. Mm -hmm. I would have enjoyed a Mayor Janet version of this. That would be funny, too. (laughs) That would be fun. several reasons, it has to be Eleanor. But I think a Janet version would be very funny as well. I agree. I think it's great character development. It's a perfect thing for Eleanor's character to move forwards next, especially as her newfound romance that's been such a big part of her character is about to get Mm -hmm. ripped away from her, at least for a while. It makes a lot of sense that it's Eleanor. But the version of Janet running the neighborhood and being great at it, I would love to see. Yeah. So Janet would just get to live his dream because he would get everything. Just make everything he wants. There'd be so many pill boys and broken hot tubs. (laughs) Janet grabs John and they go off for frozen yogurt and Eleanor grabs Michael and takes him over to the other humans says, come here, dummy. And he takes him to meet with the other humans outside. Chidi immediately can just get the vibe off of Michael and says, oh, he looks like me. That's bad. (laughs) Watching the episode a second time, it made me appreciate how specifically Chidi, they make all of the moments we get of him before the big stuff starts happening. Mm-hmm. Even though it it's like a big twist in the middle of the episode, they wrote the episode from the perspective of, no, we got to enjoy these last yeah. few unobstructed moments with Chidi. <laughs> he looks like me. That's bad. That's bad. And Eleanor tells everyone what's going on with Michael, that he's just kind of like this and that she's going to have to pretend to be the architect while Michael stresses out until he comes to. We get both Tahani and Jason's thoughts on this. Tahani's like, oh, wow. You know, if I had to think of a person who would be the best at pretending to be an all-knowing, all-powerful being, (laughs) well, first I'd pick me, but you would be a close second. (laughs) And Jason says, well, okay, if we get new jobs, I want to be a lifeguard. And Eleanor's like, Oh, that's not in mine. That's funny. Like, If if we get new jobs, I want to be the lifeguard. And Eleanor says, no, you can't just, wait, what? No, what do you, no. (laughs) And then when they're starting to talk up Eleanor and tell her that she'll do a good job, Jason says, Yeah, you're going to rock this. You're like the big photos of whatever's going on right now. I'm not really sure. (laughs) That's cute. I like that one. So because of her friends and because of her confidence in life, Eleanor is starting to feel like she could be the one to run the neighborhood. She could be the architect. Uh, based off of her experience learning what Michael did and getting those memories back and kind of seeing how that all worked last time. And because of Brad Pitt's phase where he got into architecture for a while. Is that in your episode? No. She's like, I yeah, think also, this scene must have been a lot shorter in mine because there's not Brad a lot Pitt happens in this part. a big architect phase and that really spoke to me too. I tracked that really closely, she says. <laughs> That's so, funny. I'll take over. Michael will get better and he can take his post. And there's a quiet moment. And Michael, they're all looking at him kind of for reassurance. And he just says, oh, look at the four of you guys together. I love you so much. And the reaction from all the humans have not touched by this, but like off put by this. Like Like something's wrong here. Yeah, that's okay. Eleanor gives everyone their job. She's really good at giving everyone a task as the leader. She gives Chidi the job of having Janet translate the file so it doesn't look like alien language. Tahani is going to get the welcome party going because classic Tahani. That's when she has her super funny line about how she's going to fold the napkins. She's like, oh, wait, no, couldn't matter less. Okay, I understand (laughs) that now. And then Jason, you don't really have to do anything. Just be a silent monk. And Eleanor, then later we cut, she's asking Chidi, how the file reading is going. This is a really funny joke. He's got this Mm -hmm. huge folder of files that we assume is all of John's life, but the one huge box is just one trip to Wendy's. (laughs) I get it. A lot of ramifications. I feel like I can say with abject certainty that every trip of Stephen Baker made to Wendy's is a net negative. Oh, for sure. Uh, The effect on the environment, the effect on those around me that I love. The effect on yourself, Stephen. Yeah. Well, sure. 
And with John, it's standing in line, taking too many napkins, ordering the six piece nuggets and then saying, oh, I'll be bad. Let's take the 10 piece. Oh, do they say that in the episode? Yeah. That's funny. It's not in mine. I would never be caught with a six piece nugget. Well, see, I get the six piece if I'm also getting two spicy chicken sandwiches, just as, as an aperitif to kind of, <laughs> you know, wet the palate in between the six piece spicy nugget in between the two spicy chickens. Because I think of you in all things, especially mm-hmm. fast food, I have yeah. been meaning to ask you, have you tried the new McNugget sauces? I tried the, what is it? Fiesta sauce? What the fuck do they call Mambo? it? Mambo? Mambo sauce. Man, I really, it, really like both of them. I What's the other one? Because the, the Mambo sauce is just spicy jam. Chamoy. It's like just tamarindo, which is like what they make. Mexican and sure, you're out right. Of, but go back it. to the perspective of I am at McDonald's and they always have the same six sauces. And this is something with a slightly different kind of sweet, spicy thing going on that they don't usually have. Sure, it's not like culinary excellence or something brand new that nobody's thought of before. But it's a nice I just change. don't care for that flavor a ton especially okay. in that capacity i, I liked it, it in fun. that more than i've liked it in other things the sweet and spicy jam is good i would try that i didn't know that was a thing well, maybe i'll you'd be all get some it. mcdonald's today hmm. i'm some a i'm a barbecue sauce bra you and are. buffalo do you boy. get that reference do you know the report of the week is that from uh he's the youtube fast food guy hello my day everybody. Is ruined and my disappointment is immeasurable <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah Shout report out of the week's great bra. Great yes. YouTube. Shout out. So Eleanor Come tells on the show. Me review us. He... Review our show. That'd be great. That'd be legendary. That'd be like the high point yeah. of our career. Not getting published in Newsweek. Not interviewing Joel McHale. If we get reviewed by review of the week, that'd be fucking massive. Report of the week. Put Report some respect the on there. His it's uh, name. respect. Respect. To quote She's Birdman. flustered because there's so much information to take in. And Eleanor kind of stresses. Well, this is your task and you really have to figure this out because she came to Chidi for help after like two days. So surely some of these people are going to find him and be coming to him for help immediately. And then she kind of starts telling him to try to talk him down that she started out really nervous. But now that she's kind of getting into the swing of being the leader, she's starting to remember how good she is at this type of thing and how good of a liar she is. (laughs) Really funny for Chidi to say, very fun thing to hear from your girlfriend. (laughs) He tells her that she's doing great and he, they have a. This is a really important, cute, kind of flirty, sexy moment from them mm-hmm. that really sticks out when you know what's coming next after yeah. watching it. She's got to go get ready for the first resident and they're going to say goodbye as if she's his boss. Mm-hmm. And he feels like he's kind of secretly dating his boss. And Eleanor's like, oh, yeah, huh? Mm, I don't know what that would feel like. Couldn't couldn't tell you what that's like <laughs> they tend to have a platonic goodbye. But Eleanor like goes in for a sneaky kiss and it's really cute. And she's mm-hmm. like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, my God, I'm scared and turned on. It's just all very cute. And it's then really when cute. Eleanor leaves, she grabs his butt and he like, oh, it's fun to see this super cute, this perky into these surprises. Chidi when it's with yeah. someone that he loves. Yeah. Do you think we're going to cry it. when we get to the end of the podcast? Do you think it's possible? Um, because I'm not seeing the scene, I probably won't cry. Okay. I'll make you cry. I want you to. Different reasons. Michael's in the room where the humans wake up and he summons Janet because he's really stressed. He's starting to be able to talk again, but he really just wants to get things covered in case this doesn't work out because he's really scared that it won't. He asks Mm -hmm. Janet if we can take the humans back into the void and replace them with clones or all of these things if things don't work out. And Janet has been such a good voice of reason for so many characters recently and gives another great speech to Michael of, no, we can't do any of that. Bad things have happened every time. And you know what? There's only one option now, and that's to succeed. And Michael is stressed. That's not what he wants to hear. But hearing it from Janet, I think, is the best way. How long was your episode? Like 25 minutes. This wasn't in yours either. It's It's not ringing a bell, but it seems like it should have been. It's like I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And Janet says, your only option is to succeed. And Michael says, perfect. It's my favorite number of options. One. (laughs) I don't remember that at all. Eleanor steps out there and asks how Michael's doing. He says that he feels a little better, that talking to Janet made him feel a little better. Mm -hmm. And this is the moment that I mentioned earlier, that he's ready to assist Eleanor. He's ready to be a good assistant. In fact, I've been learning some classic assistant phrases to help. Here, check this one out. I'm sorry, I sent the email, but I forgot to include the attachment. And Eleanor's like, thanks, that... Probably won't come up in this situation, but if it does, you'll be perfect at it. I don't think that whole scene was in yours, maybe. And it includes a funny Michael joke and a really sweet Michael and Janet moment. 
Yeah. Which I guess just shows how this is an episode that there's so much good. If you're going to cut anything from it, it's going to be good. It's just mm-hmm. stuff. Tahani's outside. She's hanging the welcome banner. And this is where John approaches her. And we learn their connection and a little bit more about John, that he's this kind of repulsive, repugnant celebrity gossip blogger that was such a big deal like 12 years ago at the beginning stages of the mainstream Internet. And he has this blog called The Carp, The Gossip Toilet, which was well is he known. supposed to be a Perez Hilton type. I think so. But maybe even a little skeevier. Mm hmm. And this blog, The Gossip Toilet, it was really famous for their Olsen twin turning 18 countdown. Oof. Big oof. <laughs> and Tani is trying to say everything with a smile, but the wind is taken out from her. And she's like, oh, my, you were quite mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> but he is so self-righteous. He was just mm-hmm. telling truth to power. He was bringing these people to their knees and Tani says, yeah, and also you had that segment where you measure people's thigh gap. (laughs) And John says, oh, so you're like a fan. (laughs) John is so horrible. Yeah. And this actor shows up in a few things. He's a really funny character actor. And I think he delivers it in a way that makes him so repugnant that he's also kind of hilarious. Yeah, I think that it's like he plays the mean gay BFF pretty well. in But like. So. so mean that they're a monster. They're not just the fun. Exactly. I live in Chicago. That's the stereotype. only kind of gay much friend everybody. we have. Yeah. I might be the straightest person, you know, you've been saying that a lot lately. And the more I, learn... I mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and then John, he's so incorrigible. He's like, well, I must have been doing something right. I ended up here and Tahani can't like say anything about it and just has to let it go. And he's like on this high horse. Starts talking about Tahani and oh my gosh, I I learned so much about you. Oh yeah, you died in Canada, didn't you? That's like the nip slip of dying. <laughs> well, why don't we catch up later? I've got to go do something. We'll talk about our new nose. I think it's funny here that John's idea now that he's in heaven is that he can change like his entire face. He <laughs> it's all going. This is all gone. What are the odds that you and I would end up spending eternity together? Oh my God. Tahani's worst nightmare. But I think this episode gives a lot of room to show off the Tahani that has become quietly over season three. Well, and I think this is a great example of why them going to Earth was a successful experiment to show. Absolutely. Because at the end of season two, when Tahani's given a chance to demonstrate growth, she goes right in there to the room with her parents and she grows from that. But it shows that she wasn't ready yet. And this Mm. interaction and how she handles this shows that she has grown into a person deserving of being in the good place. Good point. You're right. Tahani barges into the office where Michael and Eleanor and I think maybe Chidi are. I don't remember if Chidi's there. Uh, It is I. I Chidi's there yet. Tahani. Yeah, babe. We know what's going on. And she (laughs) explains. I love that. That's such a cute interaction. It is I. Tahani. Yeah. Yeah, babe. Yeah, babe. We know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and she explains that this is fucked. John and I know each other or he knows me and he tortured her on Earth. And now he's stuck here and it's the bad place cheating. Mm-hmm. And they've they've really like done a number on them again. Like, of course they would, because they got to pick who the four people were. Yeah, this is the line that I quoted at the beginning that I think you didn't have. She's like talking about how mean he was to her on Earth. And she says he always said I was shallow and plagued with jealousy and prone to fits of melodrama. That wasn't my episode. I just didn't remember it at the time. Okay, But now the brain's firing. Now things in this episode all start happening very quickly because as soon as they figure that out, as soon as she sees that the bad place are picking humans that are close to them and will be specifically bad for them, the mail tube sends the next piece down as Michael talks about, oh my God, this is awful. They're going to pick out our enemies, our rivals. And Eleanor says, or exes. And cut to a really great twist. Like obviously the cheaty thing that happens a little bit later is the focus, but this twist is so good that Simone's there. If you don't see it coming, if you haven't watched it before, I don't think there's any reason to see this coming until right when it happens. Yeah. I think it's a really great twist. I remember being like pretty surprised the first time yeah. watching this. And I think that it's truly brilliantly evil and it's great writing because and they always do this and we when we mm-hmm. always call them out like hey every time we feel comfort things are fine they throw a wrench and things aren't fine and, and we think the wrench doing is it just believably the, too it works well and we think at first okay the wrench is that so, michael uh, can't do it so eleanor has to run it yes then we're like oh tahani knows this guy that's here that's the wrench maybe it's all the people they they know 
from like different parts in their past or that didn't like their made them feel bad. And then it's like, oh, shit, no, it can be anyone, even Simone, which is crazy. And even to the point where we see how flustered we'll get to it in a second, how flustered Chidi gets and you don't necessarily expect his mind to go where it ends up going and the way mm-hmm. that he's so deliberately and aggressively and specific like he's made up his mind he has to say it i mean it shows that what chidi has learned over his relationship with eleanor has led him to be able to make this choice and to know Mm -hmm. what the right thing to do is and to step up we're getting ahead a little bit tawny is prone to fits of melodrama and they see simone so Mm -hmm. the gang are all outside in that welcome room and simone's still asleep and they're video chatting in with sean and the judge to talk about this and if it's kosher or not Talk, mm-hmm. I'm using all of my goy words today. There we go. I don't I don't feel like I shouldn't say Jewish a bunch of times. I feel like I I burned my counter earlier. I don't know. I like them. I <laughs> want it to be clear that I like them. They've made a lot of great stuff. I'm a fan of their work. And I feel really bad for all the stuff that happened. And I want to make it very clear to anyone listening that I had nothing to do with it. Okay. <laughs> Sean says that this isn't against the rules, even though everyone's so worked up about it. But Michael brings up that Simone's going to remember all of these people and they won't be able to act as otherworldly beings if she knows specifically who they were on Earth. Plus, John keeps saying that Tahani wasn't at Diddy's white party and she was, Eleanor. I really was. (laughs) And I I was at Diddy's white party when they brought the tigers out. Tahani was there. Jason's also really worried because how are we going to do anything if if Simone's just asleep the whole time? (laughs) I really like Sean when he gets to be his most evil. He's always evil, but him saying stuff like... Your Honor, you never stipulated that we couldn't choose people who had some sort of connection to them. Then Simone just happened to die on Earth, which was really, uh, really cool. You want to know how it happened, Chidi? It's hilarious. No! Yeah. And also how heartbreaking this is that Simone that died freaking so died. young yeah. what happened I'm sure at some point we probably learn what Maybe? happened but that's so depressing and because this show is about people that are dead it doesn't really sink in that this young yeah. important scientist just died sucks which is really really cool want to know how it happened Cheaty? our first <laughs> real stab and reaction yeah. from Cheaty on how much this hurts him he says well, no no And the judge deems, you know, fine, the connection is not against the rules, but it's a little dirty. It's a little shady. So Michael gets to wipe Simone's memory so she won't remember any of them. Have fun with your ex, Cheaty. Maybe my favorite Sean line here, he says, What's that thing you humans say when you're playing chess and you trap your opponent into an inescapable position? Oh, right. Eat butt, you ding dongs. (laughs) Yeah. Hops off the call. I like that one. So immediately everyone goes to their figuring out the solution mode like they always do when something like this happens. Eleanor is gathering the troop. She's giving everyone a job. She asks Chidi if he's okay and very obviously no, of course Mm -hmm. not. He isn't okay. And everyone's kind of trying to like overlook how hard this is actually going to be for Chidi. Yeah. Because Michael just goes to, oh, you know, it'll be easy to avoid her. You could not see her for a hundred years. It's such a big place. But of course, Chidi can't do what he's supposed to do here if yeah, that's the case because he's supposed to help all of these people. They're all supposed to help all of these people. And this totally takes him out of the mix. It's such a smart writing thing. So smart. And I think that it forces Cheaty to have to. It just highlights once again how selfless and how continuously caring about his friends and the greater good Cheaty has been through the whole show. Because Chidi now is faced with with a really tough situation. Yeah. And in the end, he's always going to sacrifice himself. When it was somebody has to go in the obelisk, Chidi's going to go. <laughs> somebody has to go to the bad or place. Or when someone Chidi's has gonna to stand go. up and say they're the problem in the neighborhood from the very Chidi first time he it. got the chance. Yeah. Every yeah. time. So it, it just once again, Chidi is best best girl all the way around. Not to mention how complex the feelings are because the only reason Simone and Chidi's relationship ended is because Chidi was burdened with the knowledge of the afterlife. It wasn't because there weren't feelings that yeah. did set him down the road to where he was able to get with Eleanor. But what happens now when he's a fresh slate uh, to skip ahead a little bit more with these two women, does he fall for Simone again? Mm. What does this do for all of the dynamics? I don't remember. And I'm excited to see the wrench that this throws and everything. So Eleanor says that we're that Chidi needs to take it step by step, and we all need to take it step by step. And the first thing is that everybody needs to leave Chidi specifically so she can go wake up Simone, his dead ex-girlfriend, and bring mm-hmm. her into the room. 
And GDS like, oh, that's the first step. That's it. That's all the first <laughs> that's step. That's it. We go back to Tahani, who's trying to change up things with John and is really trying to kill him with kindness. But John is just insufferable, saying immediately things like, oh, did you have to give your sister's name to get in here? And Tahani just, ha ha, yeah, we're so lucky to be here. <laughs> and changes the subject to it being the most exclusive place she's ever been, more so than the Met Gala Gala. I don't think that scene was in mind. That's it's a secret gala that nobody knows except the elite few at the Met Gala. And then John, maybe this wasn't in your episode. Tani says that and John laughs and says, oh, my God, you're like Chrissy Teigen, but whiter. Yeah. Damn, he's ruthless. Yeah, it's a funny <laughs> joke because of what they're trying to paint this mm -hmm. guy as. But it is not a funny That's joke. Cutting. And it took the wind mm -hmm. out of the room when we watched the episode yeah. last night. Oof. Eleanor opens the door for Simone and says, wait, was that little scene with Tahani and John in there at all then? No, not even okay. a little bit. Because it comes back to them a little bit later. And that probably yeah. was in your episode. Wow. So when it comes back, I think for me is when Tahani's talking to Janet. Yeah. OK, so Eleanor opens the door for Simone. Hi, Simone. I'm Eleanor. Come on in. And we immediately cut to Simone touring the neighborhood with Eleanor. And we mm -hmm. get such a good little burst of why this character stood out so much in the first half of the season. Because Eleanor says, well, as a neuroscientist, are you surprised that there's an afterlife? Oh, yeah, frankly. I mean, there's a decent chance this entire thing is just a complex electrochemical reaction caused by my synapses randomly firing in the millisecond after my death. But this Froyo is amazing, so I'm just going to roll with it. That's such a perfect Simone reaction mm -hmm. to all of it's this. It's great. She's like, but this frozen yogurt is so delicious, so I'm not even worried about that right now. <laughs> I think that line is almost the thing I remember the most about Simone in this storyline was her thinking that this is all just my brain playing a trick on me. So none of it really matters. They continue down that thread, don't they? Yeah, that's they kind do. of her plot line in season four. She's mm -hmm. like, this is all fake. I'm dead. Yeah, I remember. What do I now. care? Throw me in the trash. Simone feels like everyone in the neighborhood is so nice. And actually, that makes a lot more sense to how she reacts in this moment where Eleanor says, yeah, everyone's nice. But don't how about you don't talk to anybody but me and Michael for the next 6000 years. <laughs> And any normal person would be like 6,000 years, just the two of yeah. you. But Simone doesn't think any of like, this is whatever. real. So she's like, yeah. yeah, okay. Michael mentions that it's time to prep for the next resident. <laughs> so they have to go off. And Eleanor says to Simone, yeah, he's way better than my last talking panda assistant. That guy was not helpful. <laughs> not in your episode? Don't think so. And again, Simone just, mm-hmm. And then she walks off smiling, just looking at all the things around mm -hmm. like a little kid. Clearly she's... Dreamland doesn't think any of this matters. Yeah. Fade back to, to Chidi looking forlorn yeah. in the background. Yeah. Oh, Chidi, you're supposed to be saying the fuck the away. Distance. Don't be 30 feet behind her. But can you say you wouldn't do the same thing? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. It is a little horror movie. Like if you don't mm -hmm. know it's Chidi and you just saw this image, you'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> now we're back to the part that you had with Tahani and John because Tahani summons Janet and she's really trying to break him down with her words and has this quip about Mark Fakeobs. What is your shirt? Mark Fakeobs. Is that savage enough, Janet? Janet says, oh, well, yeah, that is savage. Oh, but... I missed one of my questions for you today, huh. Zach. Trivia questions. I okay. don't think I asked it. I think I jumped right over it. It was what percentage did Tahani have of getting an oh, honey? Like 90%? 29. Oh. OK, wouldn't have gotten it right. Would and it have, will yeah. devastate you for the rest of your life. I like those <laughs> odds. I'm going to go tell them exactly what I think. <laughs> and then, of course, Tahani realizes because of all of her growth, what she's doing. This is clearly what the bad place wants. So she has to work against her type and and turn the tables on the bad place. She says that she believes there is good in John and she'll find it. It is not I who is trapped with him, but it is he who is trapped with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Tahani is so freaking funny in this episode. She just gets funnier, doesn't she? Yeah. Especially now that everything she does is just as Tahani, but without all the condescension towards mm -hmm. everyone, it really does allow her to be so much funnier. So she sits back down, tells John she's happy he's there, that they're going to put everything behind them. They're going to move forward together. I think John's hilarious. Oh, my God. You are so cute. You are so cute. It's gross. You disgust me. I love you. Get out of here. I never want to see you again. I love you so much. <laughs> Talk cute. about some type of like schizophrenic personality disorder. He's like go. the sassy gay friend to the point. He has like a personality disorder. Yeah. It's bad. I love it. Back in the office. 
Eleanor is telling Chidi and Michael that she thinks the situation with Simone went pretty well. I relate to this when she says pretending she's never met people is kind of her power move. Yeah. That's what happened when that guy from Family Video ran into me at the <laughs> Meyer. Was like, you were like, and then when he said my name, like, fuck, yeah, Sanson. Hi, I know you. <laughs> Shout out Sanson twice in a row. Shout out Sanson. Terrible name. Michael thinks that also what's working is this dynamic with him and Eleanor, because Eleanor can be the face while he's putting everything together, running the numbers, crunching everything in the back, like Cyrano de Bergerac, Tom Bergeron, or Chris Jenner. <laughs> but Chidi speaks up because nobody is giving him the space to. He shatters this glass and says it won't be okay because of everything, because of how he's feeling, because of how tense it is, because of how he's going to ruin it. And he ends that statement by saying, which is why you need to erase my memory and reboot me. He says it without any hesitation. He says it without any heavy emotion in this moment. He's certain. This man who is so stomach ache uncertain, he's certain of this. One thing that I think is smart is every character has grown and the writers know that. Chidi's grown to this point, but Michael has grown to the point where he's not like, okay, yeah, sure. Boom. Wipe it. Yes. Michael's like, no, there's got to be a way that's not that. Eleanor is like, what are you talking about? Like, um, no forking no. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Chidi thinks that Sean was right, that this is his checkmate. What do you say? Eat butt. <laughs> dumb yeah. something. I forget what he Eat says butt. already. Not dumb, dumb. Not dingus. Uh, ding dongs. Eat ding butt, dong. ding dongs. Yeah. This is checkmate. Chidi will be too freaked out to help. And the only way to make him to the point where he is pure and can help in the way that he is called upon to do by this experiment is if he doesn't know any of this. Yeah. And there's going to be a while of everyone else kind of trying to come up with an idea. But yeah, like, right. There's no, he, he, there's as soon not. as he says it, you weren't thinking of it, but it makes sense. Cause Eleanor's like, well, you can live with seeing your ex, but Chidi's like, it's not, Running into them at the scenario. dentist. Yeah. Yeah. This is like, it's not I just being awkward this. to get uh, around your ex-girlfriend. It's if I'm awkward, the whole universe collapses. Every, yeah. every not just everybody in his circle. Everybody is tortured forever. So Michael, he's the one most next to Eleanor who thinks that there's got to be another way. And Eleanor thinks, okay, well, come on. What if we just remove memories of, of Simone? But Michael is the one who knows better than that and is able to yeah. tell her that, no, if we do that, your memories with each other are too connected. He'll forget you too. That won't help mm -hmm. anything. And Chidi says, yeah, you guys, I've thought of everything. I didn't just say this. I know what's going on here. If you don't do this, I will ruin this experiment. And yeah. sure, their relation, he doesn't say this here, but my thought, their relationship is beautiful, but this is worldly bigger than that in a in a mm -hmm. really, truly pure way. I think that this reminds me of, and I've mentioned it to you before, but one of the most creative pseudo deaths of a character I've ever seen had to do with memory. And it was a character lost their memory for like three years, built a really tight relationship with somebody and then regained their memory, but lost those three years. And that it examined a lot how both people were feeling. The person who didn't have those memories and now is coming back, which she's already experienced to some degree before where he's like, Eleanor, I don't have those memories. I don't. That wasn't me. And now Chidi, once again, now that he has those feelings, this him does have that. He's going to lose that again when Eleanor for a third time has to fall in love with Chidi. Well, she's already in love, but she has to hope that he falls in love with her mm -hmm. sometime over the next year or after that year, what's going to happen? I think or it's 300 it's really, years. It's tough. You know, yeah. if I were in either of their situations, it would be one of the hardest things to do like erasing. I mean, cause how long have they known each other now in this reality? Three years, two or three years. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's tough. Eleanor was the first person to come to him. He was the person that changed her life regardless of the romance things. And he's not going to remember any of that. And that's really tough. Yeah, and the way that they build up to the and it erases us when it starts with, but that'll erase Australia and the experiment mm -hmm. and the brainy bunch and here and yeah, and it erases us, I know. Oof. So a little bit later, everyone now is in Michael slash Eleanor's office before Chidi's memory is going to be erased. We don't see Eleanor make the decision that, yes, you're right. The, mm -hmm. It's just everybody knows. So we cut to a little bit later when that's what's happening and everyone's just kind of yeah. sitting in it. Michael says that the judge signed off on them being able to do it. And because of it, they're going to get a little bit of extra time before the other two residents come mm -hmm. in. And Tahani will have to push her welcome party back a day. 
And Chidi kind of brings up, you know, next time you guys see me, it'll be like I'm a new resident and I won't know any of you guys. Mm -hmm. What about this Jason moment? I think it's, it's so, so cute. It I think makes me want to cry. It honestly, like it made me tear up. Like that was one of the first times the episode that I started to really tear up was Jason just so pure. Well, you remember that time we we stayed up late and ate pizza together? Nobody. Will you remember uh, the time we when ordered we ordered the pizza? The pizza? <laughs> Nobody. Will you remember, you remember pizza? pizza? Do you mean like, will I remember what pizza <laughs> is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. What did you say that the chicken nuggets were in relation to your 16 chicken sandwiches? An aperitif. A, a yeah, nice this little... is an emotional aperitif mm -hmm. to the big emotions that are coming in the scenes ahead because it does kind yeah. of make you want to cry, but it's still happy, sad, sweet, wholesome mm -hmm. that it's a laugh. Tahani even is able to say that Chidi and Eleanor are such a perfect couple. <laughs> They're the most perfect couple I've seen since Drake and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> and Eleanor, she said, yeah, uh, she's coming to terms with how angry she is with the bad place and how this is the most intricate cork blurk possible. <laughs> and then she has to give it to them that the cursing filter keeps the rhyme and that makes it more satisfying. It's true. But Michael still hasn't given up yet on his friends. And Michael is usually the man with the plan. So I think us as the audience are supposed to think Michael's going to come up with the idea. And I love the way that he says this because it's very meta thinking about the show. He hasn't given up yet. And he says, uh, I don't know, we'll get Chinese food and we'll throw pencils and stick them in the ceiling. And someone will say something innocuous. And I'll say, wait, say that say again. Say that again. Because that's what's happened every other time. Oh. And Chidi knows that that won't happen because if there was another choice, even though he's underselling how like torn up emotionally he is by this because he's so sure it's the right idea. Chidi, kind of, you have to believe me that if there was another thing, I would do it. This is the thing that has to be done. And Eleanor is very mature when she sees what Michael's going through. And you love humans. This is such a classic human situation. Your friends are going through something awful and there's nothing you can do. And that is such a human experience. Yeah, it is. And all you want to do, whether it's your friend, whether it's your partner, whether it's your family, whether it's a uh, work person when mm -hmm. you care about someone you want to, you more than anything you want to like take that away from the person yeah and we cannot do that sometimes and it's devastating and it's devastating for michael while also showing his growth too and how much he cares about these people the way you said it is perfect he's not just okay snap let's go it really mm -hmm. weighs heavy on him everything does now i think but the time's come point, one of the most human things is having somebody so close to you that cares so much about suffering and being helpless to change that. And when I put you into that position, you really enjoy it. <laughs> I enjoy the suffering. We, our, our sex life is mainly a big saw <laughs> trap situation. Yeah. Almost exclusively these days. Puppets included. Mm -hmm. So the times come, Eleanor says, okay, really like dejectedly, maybe she's just got a mask because of what she's going through. Mm -hmm. She says, okay, snappy, snappy, wipey, wipey. It's time to clear yeah. Chidi's memory. Michael says that he still needs a few minutes to work it all out. And the group and Janet all leave him to it. I think there's a really sweet character choice here where Chidi's kind of close to Eleanor when he says that. And then as they're walking out of the room, like Tahani kind of grabs his hand, and, like walks him out because Chidi and that. Tahani are close too. like they're, they're all wow. a unit together. And that was kind of Tahani and Chidi's goodbye moment for me was was that little choice. The next scene is really where things get emotional as we go towards the end of the episode. I remember getting emotional when this first aired. There are specific lines from Chidi in a little bit that just mm -hmm. cut to the soul. And this is such a good example of how great this show is and how it's about such silly things that are steeped in such deep truths and such human emotions that we can now be crying over the fact that this character who's going to be in the next episode, who's not going anywhere, yeah. isn't going to is having their memory wiped like it's <laughs> men in black. Something that's happened thousands of times so far, but this how, time it hurts the most. How this show has so effectively steeped us in their world that much like they've steeped us in the characters that we understand who the characters are, even when they're not themselves, they're in other bodies. We understand these human emotions on a deeper level than most shows, even though they're talking about IHOP and these crazy otherworldly things. I think it's such a good showcase of why this show works and 
all of these episodes, all of these hours of content really adding up to this scene for this emotional climax that we've never really had in this way, even though you're right that Eleanor's had to do this several times, but we've really watched this version of them find each other, wait mm-hmm. for each other, pine for each other, work together. And now here they are, they're sitting alone together in these chairs at the orientation stage where so many things have happened in the beginning of the show where Chidi stood up for Eleanor, all of these things. And finally, Chidi starts to talk about how he's feeling after being mm-hmm. the the brave savior for everyone. And he just keeps saying, I, I, I hate this. I really hate this. Yeah. Is it clear that I hate this? Because I really, really hate this. And Eleanor's so mature talking about just how she she knows why this is happening and she Mm -hmm. hates it, but she doesn't want Chidi to apologize or feel bad because he's making the sacrifice to save his friends. And finally, we get the turn. This is almost serious finale vibes of this is why people love moral philosophy professors. Oh, my God. How many times have we heard this is why people hate moral philosophy professors and for it to be turned around in this sweet way. Oh, man, (laughs) it's just great. I think that another reason why this is so hard for Michael is Michael has done this before. The time that we, you know, see the clip of cheating Eleanor when they slept together and said they loved each other, Michael rebooted them right after that. Yeah. You know, and they're like, we're going to face Michael together. What happened immediately after was him saying, snap, undo all of that. And it hurts more this time because we got to see their progression from beginning to there. But they were at this point when they got snapped away before and it just it hurts so much. And I'm sure Michael's trying everything because because he knows how terrible that was that he was doing that to them. Well, and, and when this that time happened, he cares then, even more about them. He was in a more reboot happy place. Now these people yeah. are his friends that mean more than anything to him in the world. He, who would have ever thought that a being like Michael would be invested in like the relationship of these two. Humans. Yeah, but he is more than he has been with anything so far. And we sh- see that in a second. The other line here that's really sweet, Chidi says, you know what? Every time after I reboot that you see me having a stomach ache, just imagine I'm thinking about you. Oh, so all the time. Exactly. That got me. That yeah. that was the, one of the things I was like, oh, uh, no. My too heart. sweet, too sad. Mm-hmm. And Michael arrives. He's got a going away present for them. And he cues it up. The screen pops up. The first time I watched this episode, it was the conversations that made me emotional and not the clip reel. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, the second time when I was taking the notes of it, it really hit me this time. Clip reel ripped me to shreds. Michael presents this film and it's some memories you may have forgotten is what it says. And because it's the good place, they don't ever just show us clips. They show Mm -hmm. us things we haven't seen before, which makes it more meaningful when we do see the glimpses of things we have seen before in a new light. So we see all of this being told silently, the story of Eleanor and Chidi's Mm -hmm. relationship throughout all the timelines. It's really sweet. We see them when they very first meet as soulmates and bring it in, man, and they hug each other. Uh, We see Chidi when he's teaching Eleanor ethics on his own when it was just the two of them. And then we cut to something new, which is Eleanor (laughs) teaching him like the Kardashian hierarchy, which is really sweet. We see them hug in times of stress. We see how Chidi comforts him when she's startled by the animal in the room and it turns into him holding her is very sweet. We see them having a date on a boat, kind of similar. It calls back Mm -hmm. to when Eleanor set that up for Chidi as an act of friendship. But we see in the timeline where they fell in love with each other, how they began to do those things together. We see them kiss a lot of times and we really great kiss acting from the actors because we see how the different kisses mean different things. We see them kiss in many different ways. We see them kiss quickly, like in a, hey, I'm leaving, I'll see you later. We see them kissing when Chidi rushes to get that kiss when she's about to leave. Like, man, you, the entire story of a relationship so in 30 seconds in such a in such a beautiful way. I think they're really intelligent cuts away from it too. We see Eleanor just like a couple tears on her face and Chidi just smiling because he knows that this is, who he knows well, that this is the last a lot time of this he can for like the first first time he all of it for the first yeah. first time because he doesn't have any memory so he's just happy and I think that shows to Chidi that he knows that this is the person this is his real soulmate and this is the person that they're gonna find each other again and I think for Chidi that's what he's getting from the video whereas Eleanor is seeing that but mostly she's seeing things that she has and hasn't seen and, and she'll it's just have a the reminder of what she's about to lose yeah. yeah. 
And I think that it, it's really smart how they have different reactions to the video. And they have a little cuddle while they're on the chairs. We see mm -hmm. them like lean into each other. It's such a nice moment when we see them get caught in the rain together is mm -hmm. the last thing we see. And Oof. what's so cute about it at first is the way that Chidi like prances and and cartoonishly dances around. And we just see this way that he is guard completely down when he's with Eleanor. Mm -hmm. He's so free when he's with her. And in this moment, you see it. And then it turns to them dancing in the rain and then they kiss in the rain and this is the moment the last time i watched it where i noticed like wow i'm i'm writing down what they're doing and i have, I have tears down my yeah. face and i'm not crying now but i do feel that head i feel the emotion it, it's crazy mine are, mine are welling up a little bit it's crazy the, yeah. the how human this all is and how deep they've got us feeling for these characters so the video ends eleanor wipes a tear and they have she has to bring some levity to the moment with some jokes that are usually about how attractive she is. She says, I don't mm -hmm. cry at movies, but that one was pretty good. And the girl was hot <laughs> and the guy was too. <laughs> and Chidi's who's tearing a little bit now talks about how he's going to miss Eleanor, but Eleanor knows that he won't, he won't have any awareness. And that's what's so scary. Eleanor says that she's going to miss him. And, and what you said earlier, you, I think it was one of your trivia questions. Mm -hmm. You're just going to think I'm some sexy godlike figure who you want to hump immediately. <laughs> I think this is just so smart because last episode they tease, wow, what would life be like if we got to like just be a couple and live together and do things? And they don't get that, but this is their glimpse into what that could have been for them. Totally them, like, take studying back what I kissing. said about that moment last week, feeling mm -hmm. like this is spin off -y. It would have been if that's what they would have done for the next season. And I think for a second, that's what I misremembered that they did. Mm -hmm. But now it's so tragic because they almost got to have that. Yeah. And they got to taste it, but now they don't get to live in it. Yeah. Heartbreaking. And Chidi says, I know you're just trying to make a joke about how hot you are because you're really sad. And she says, I'm not a joke. I'm a legit snack. <laughs> I love that line. And Chidi's so sure of himself and he's so he feels so safe and secure because he knows even though he won't know anything, now he knows that then Eleanor will be taking care of him. And that's mm -hmm. all he needs to know that he'll make it through. These are the last lines, the last goodbye moments that really stick out to me that I remember, that I remember getting emotional the first time I heard them five years ago. I wish we had more time together, Eleanor says. And Chidi, the way that the Jeremy Baramy joke comes back here, oh and you're my like, why God. is Jeremy Baramy making me cry? Oh, time means nothing. Jeremy Baramy, baby. We'll just we'll get through this. And then you and I can chill out in the dot of the eye forever. What a cute, suave, <laughs> Steven's tearing up, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's me too. It me too. It's beautiful. And William Jackson Harper, what a good actor. He delivers these lines so well where it I don't know, it's such a layered character and he, when he gets into his cool guy mode and it's because he is certain but it's also because he's trying to take these last moments to give Eleanor what she needs to feel at peace with what's about to happen. Oh, it's so good. I don't remember good, if it's Eleanor, guy, Chidi. the best girl, always. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's Chidi or Eleanor who says it, but they talk about how they, I think Eleanor, how they found each other before hundreds of times. They can do it one more time. Hopefully they can. I hope they can. I can't wait to see how it leads to how I remember the show ending. Yeah. At this moment, Michael steps on stage and he just gives the most respectful, like when you're going to like put your dog down or something, just the most <laughs> respectful little like nod in their direction. Like it's time. Everything's ready. I love how Michael's saying he needs a few minutes to get everything together is a lot more than just needing a few minutes to get everything mm -hmm. together. He goes to what do they need before this happens? Yeah. And he puts that together in a really great way. And then he steps up and he takes them to the next plane in a way that only a friend, a loving friend can do. Mm -hmm. So Eleanor says goodbye and they share their last kiss. And then we see Eleanor tearfully watch him leave. Oh, <sighs> another great Oof. scene. This is one of my favorite scenes in the episode after this. Eleanor's sitting quietly in now her office and she calls for Janet. And she just wants Janet to tell her what's the answer. And immediately mm -hmm. Janet has that what look on her face. And Eleanor's going through. We heard last week, the well, you know, you worry about being in a relationship when you don't have it. And then when you do have it, you worry about it being gone. 
And now she wants the answer from Janet. What's the point of all this? What's the point of loving someone if they're going to leave? And how is it somehow worse to just not have love in your life? Uh, yeah. She talks yeah. about the universe just being full of pain and how she doesn't like it. And Janet is one of her very best friends at this point And is this all knowing being and just give me the answer. And Janet responds. And I think Janet in the scene is amazing. Just within, I know how you feel. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't tell you the answer, but I know how you feel. And it's a different situation, but you reframe it how Janet has been through this. The yeah. person that she loved didn't remember him. And we had to watch her have to be a servant to him without being able to open up about it because it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. And that's what Eleanor is now going to have to do. And Janet's the perfect person to give Eleanor the speech. She's talking about it and she's still Janet. So she says, you know, it's kind of like the moment before someone pushes a plunger and murders you. <laughs> and like, oh, yeah, OK. And she starts to talk about how she's becoming more human. And the more human she becomes, the less she understands anything. And that's beautiful. And she likes it. And isn't that kind of the point of it all? Isn't that what being a human is? If there were an answer I could give you to how the universe works, it wouldn't be special. It would just be machinery fulfilling its cosmic design. It would just be a big, dumb food processor. But since nothing seems to make sense, when you find something or someone that does, it's euphoria. In all of this randomness, in this pandemonium, you and Chidi found each other and you had a life together. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that just the sweetest? It brings That's another great. tear to your eye. Janet, just how far she's come. And oh, it's so, so, so beautiful. Such the perfect Love speech. It. And it's that line that really, because this episode has been so plot focused, but underneath mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of big messages. And yeah. it's that little paragraph from Janet that explains the point of all this and why this isn't just silly afterlife shenanigans. This is why you care about this, because it's all about how important and how rare life is and how chaotic mm -hmm. it all is and how beautiful it is when anything works out and how often we don't have the time or capacity to realize that until the thing is left totally so nice eleanor says pandemonium i know what that means place of all demons it's from paradise lost chidi got her to read it by saying that satan is totally her type in that <laughs> you know bald man with the goatee yeah yeah totally your type yeah. <laughs> And that helps Eleanor come to her conclusion that she needs to embrace the pandemonium. That musical that I've been in a bunch of times, Spelling Bee, that I love so much. Mm -hmm. There's a song called Pandemonium. And every time they say pandemonium, it makes me think of it. It's the big, all the kids are frustrated and life is pandemonium. Nice. I love it so much. It made me think about it every time. Do you spell pandemonium over and over again while you sing it? No. The song is like all of the kids that are trying so hard. It seems like when they get asked questions, asked spelling words, they're really hard. But then like the audience volunteers come up and get like cow and like dog. That's great. And they're all like yelling about how unfair it is, how people get like free rides when they're trying That's so, so hard. That's so funny. And it's the part where there's like in the chorus, all the kids yell out, God damn it. And it's a really funny <laughs> moment. I love it. Love spelling nice. bee. But Eleanor is going to embrace her pandemonium. She's going to find happiness in the unique insanity of being here now i feel like that's been my outlook I've, I've got this such like a we can get crushed like a bug and probably will at any second and that's fucked mm -hmm. up and everything's fucked up and crazy and that kind of makes it awesome so just like <laughs> ride along yeah, absolutely i think life is is valuable so we need to enjoy it while we have it that's a stance you're willing to take steven mm -hmm. maybe pro-life you could even say well, if you say that life is valuable, how would you squeeze a fetus until every drop of life is out of it? You're pro-life. I just turned you into a Republican. Admit it. You know, the I think it's the same it. concept Guys, as piercing it. a baby's ears when they're born. They're too little to remember that. <laughs> oh, well, even more so. Baby. They're too primordial to remember it. And they, exactly. It's soup. They can't remember. Soup can't get mad because you slurp it. <laughs> Don't slurp it, please. Yeah. I don't want anyone to think that Steven like uh, hangs out behind the Planned Parenthood and every time they <laughs> and just make scoops. a deposit to the dumpster. I take my label and I'm just scooping embryos One man's out of the trash. dumpster. <laughs> mm. How cute is it when Janet says, in the words of the man I love, and then goes into her Jason impression, but it's not Jason Janet. 
it's Janet doing Jason. It's Which a different is impression. Cute. You got this, dog. <laughs> My favorite line you, here. Though. For a robot, you make a really good girlfriend. I am one of I'm those one three of those things. three things. <laughs> Friend. Because mm -hmm. it's just for a robot, you make a really good girlfriend. The three things are robot girlfriend. She's a friend. The reason yes. is friends. It all comes the back to the is reason friends. is friends. When that line hit and I didn't just let it go too fast before the next thing comes. Oh, that's really sweet that she mm -hmm. is a friend. That is the one thing. She, that is, she is a friend. That's really cute. She wishes Eleanor luck and she boops away into the void or to help other residents. Mm -hmm. And then it's time. And it's not because I don't like the way the season ends. It's because it's a little bit of a cork blork at the mm -hmm. end of the episode here that Eleanor opens the door. She does a great job covering up what she's feeling. But because we know, we see every bit that she's feeling mm -hmm. as she says, hi, Chidi, I'm Eleanor. Come on in. He stands up and walks to the office and the credits hit and the season ends. And that's Oof. the end of season three of The Good Place. Really good. I don't have anything bad to say about this episode. I think it's so smart. I think it's often funny. And it is just so touching and sweet and sad in a way for... I don't know, man. Like, think of how this show makes you cry versus most of the other NBC sitcoms, how they try yeah. to make you cry. It hits different. Yeah, absolutely. I think that for me, this is about as close to a perfect episode of this kind of show as you can get. I don't have any issues with it. For me, I hold this episode about as high as I hold any of the other ones that we've talked about. And it's a totally different thing. But I, I'm so into the how well this episode is crafted and how well it was set up i think it's it's perfect for me and it does reframe the season it mm -hmm. doesn't take away some of the episodes that felt like a lull compared to other episodes and other seasons you can't take that yeah. away even if you know that it's leading to something good that mm -hmm. doesn't really take away some of my qualms with certain episodes but this does absolutely change how i feel about season three as a whole and feeling like the way it begins with them on earth and the way it ends with them on the next i think Maybe at one point it seemed to to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next mm -hmm. thing, just like throwing something away as soon as it becomes interesting. But now I see the grand story arc, especially now that we've talked about each episode this way. Yeah, I see how nothing is brought up for nothing and nothing is dropped for nothing. If they drop something, it's almost always to bring it back later. And I'm very excited to just for a couple of weeks drop where we're at in the show here mm -hmm. so we can come back to it and dive into the Good Place's final season, which I've only seen once, and I remember feeling so satisfied by every bit of it. Mm -hmm. I also I have only seen it once. To dive really deep into it and to rediscover everything that it holds. So this was the last episode that I had seen of The Good Place before I watched it through with Danny again, because I had finished. This was as, as much the as same existed, exact thing. and then there just wasn't. It didn't come out for a little bit, and then I just hadn't watched it because I was, you know, waiting moving. to watch it with your partner. Yeah, or and, whatever. and then that's what I did. I came back to it with her and watched through. And so I, I had a lot of memories of, of watching this episode with her for the first time. But I think this episode as a whole just really makes you appreciate the people in your life that are really special to you because it can all change suddenly, maybe not the exact same way, but I think it, it, it encourages you to really value those that you can be your authentic self around. And I think that's a really beautiful message that the episode delivers. That was a great Linus Charlie Brown speech to wrap the whole thing together. Good job. Thank you. That was really true and good. Linus is my That's our conversation on the season three finale, Pandemonium, an excellent episode. And next week, after we do one more thing, you know, we've got the round table and we're going to look through all of our data, all of our arguments, all of our opinions from this season, come up with our top five episodes and our bottom three episodes along with deciding who goes to the good and bad mm -hmm. place based off of the points we've awarded just this season. And we've got one last chance to give some points today by giving our good and bad places for the week. Let's start with the bad place. I'll kick it off because I think it's pretty easy to give it to John. Obviously, the point is that he's bad and the show is going to give him time to hopefully change. That's the goal. But based off of this episode, I cannot think of anybody else who deserves to go to the bad place, especially in my cut that has the whiter than Chrissy Teigen line. It's yeah, I'm going to agree what with you, you there. I'm going to give it to good old John. I think John's funny, but John definitely earned several bad place points this episode. I think he's borderline hilarious, but mm -hmm. he's cruel and it, yeah. he definitely deserves the bad place. That's easy. And the good place is easy, too. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. does 
good. And everyone, like Eleanor gets a lot of points for being presented with this thing. Yeah. Everything in her wants to fight against it. And she gives up the fight pretty selflessly pretty early on. But that doesn't shine a candle to someone who gives up their life, Mm -hmm. gives up everything for a purely selfless act that has nothing to do with them. He knows what the right thing to do is. He knows what the greater good is and he does it and he's certain of it. And of course it's Chidi. He's the best boy. He gets a lot of points for how decisive he is in this episode, for how supportive of a partner he is in this episode and for how good of a servant to the people around him to make the world a better place, to keep everybody safe in the detriment of his own life, but not in a Doug Forsett way in a, yeah, really truly noble good pure way so of course it's the good place for chidi and i can't imagine you'd do any different no i wholeheartedly agree i think this is one of the best chidi episodes in a show full of great chidi episodes so i i chidi just demonstrates I gave him once a good again place last week too and yeah. this is like another level of good place for chidi. several levels up i think this is one of the goodest place good places that we could possibly award to chidi this week Well, Steven, I've had so much fun recapping this show. We both teared up a little bit on this one. I always see things a different way. And I love taking the time to give the show its due to let it like really soak into us and talk about it and to ponder it together. I love doing it. Thank you. If you listen to this, I hope you had fun with us. Send us in your thoughts on Pandemonium and season three as a whole. If you think we were a little harsh on it and come back next week and we'll talk about it on the round table. Email us at timeknifepod at gmail.com. Anytime you've got any thoughts and we might feature them on the show. And if you like what we're doing here and you want to get more of us, you want to get exclusive podcasts like The Basement or That 70s Rewatch Podcast, our live pre-show, our kind of talk radio morning half hour that we do every time we record the podcast. You can't diss a pre-show. If you want this podcast a week early, we've already got next week's in the bag over there at Patreon. So go ahead and check it out if you want to listen to the roundtable early. Or if you just want to support a small content creator that's been giving you weekly content without delay for three years. I think that says something. And if you've been hanging out with us for a while, check us out on Patreon. You can also join as a free member over at patreon.com slash can't disappoint podcast. Steven, where else can the people find us? If you want to hang around in the dot of the eye with us for a while. There we go. That's I'll take that one. I'll use that. Go follow us over on Twitter and Instagram over at time knife pod, where you can also see uh, all sorts of fun little giblets and and dingles that we, we made talked about the there. Patreon angle earlier. Where yeah. you mean dingle and giblets? Mean the if that's what you just said. <laughs> Basically, uh, go follow us over on YouTube to subscribe. Slap the bell to get notified. Yeah. I slapped something, uh, but that's where you'll see the video. Watch us cry. See what what uh what Gooby's up to. See how as Gooby inches closer and closer to being directly in front of the camera, and Zach scoots further and further back. Rightfully uh, so. Gooby's a star. Gooby's a star. I'm a star. I'm a star. I'm a stone. I'm a stone. <laughs> well, if that's everything we've got to cover. I am until, a doctor. Until next week. Why don't you get us out of here, my friend? From inside the time knife. Black Lives Matter. I'm Zach. And I am Steven. And from inside the dot of the eye, we'll see you next time. But hang out with us here until we come back. It's all Jeremy Bear Me, baby. Jeremy Bear Me, baby. We love you. We'll see you next week. Life is random and unfair. Life is pandemonium. Double a caucus. Aww.